Let me welcome all of you. I'm really glad to see so many of you here today. We have a terrific guest and a very, very important book. But to begin with, let me just welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host. I'm your chief cat herder for the next hour. And I'm your guide to the conversation that we're about to have. Now, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome back President Paul LeBlanc. We've hosted him about a year ago almost to talk about the unusual projects, the unusual transformation, the unusual successes he's had at Southern New Hampshire University. Now, Paul is the author of a brand new book from Harvard University Press called Students First. This is a book which takes a really close look at the promise higher education has for access and equity. The idea that anybody can get into higher education, work hard and get a degree that takes them into the middle class or beyond. And Paul dives deeply into this to show how that promise is broken and then tries to show ways that we can fix it. It's a very, very powerful book, which I strongly recommend. In order to discuss it, let me just welcome President Paul LeBlanc. Brian, thanks so much for having me. You're, uh, I can't imagine a better um, conversation partner. It's great to well, be with you. Well, it's great to see you, Paul. You're, you're coming to us from Seattle today, right? I am from Renton, just outside Seattle. And, uh, okay. Yep. So we have to imagine that the white behind you is actually clouds about to, uh, about to rain. You could, since it's Washington, but it's actually quite a lovely day outside. <laughs> this is a, okay. this is a, a room at the Hyatt. Oh, good. Well, uh, enjoy that as it, as it, as it lasts. I agree. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, congratulations on your new book. I'm, I'm really, really pleased to hear about that. Um, and we're going to dive into it in a second. But first, Paul, I, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, when we brought you on board last time, I asked you what you were looking forward to for the next year, what are the big projects and ideas. And since then, so much has changed, uh, in particular in terms of the pandemic. Uh, and also your book is out. I, I'm just curious. What does it say, you know, fall 2021 and spring 2022, what does that look like for you? What are the big things that you're thinking about and uh, planning on? Um, it's funny, I was just doing a State of the Union um, report for an upcoming board meeting. And on paper, we probably had our best year ever, right? So we, in this last year, we grew by 40,000 students. We hired a thousand more full-time uh, staff to support them. We uh, surpassed the billion dollar mark in terms of operating size. Um, we acquired a Kenzie Academy, like and just, you know, front after front, I think this looks great. And then I end that paragraph by saying that I've never been more worried. <laughs> so my worries are um, the world is different. It's changed and student behaviors have changed and employee behaviors have changed. And we're in the middle of it. And when you're in the middle of it, it's really hard to know, right? Like we, the world keeps moving. So we have to place bets and we have to operate this place and make decisions every day. But we're doing it with, you know, the old benchmarks aren't holding up. Um, the, we are, we're pretty data driven and all of those sort of things that we used to look at and sort of say year over year, like how are we doing, you know, 2019, 2020, 21 it's like, I don't know if those are worth very much to us right now. And as my old friend Clay Christensen says, you know, said, you know, data is a rear view mirror and I'm looking for, for sort of headlights. I need to sort of get through the fog here. Um, so it's been, a, it's an interesting time. And I think what it means is uh, being as active a learner as we can be. That's, I just met with our group of young leaders who are in a special program that we do to bring them along as like, we need you to be learners right now. We don't need we don't need opining. We need questioning. <laughs> so, actually, you know, Brian, it's been on this journey. I've been doing my own learning journey in this context. Is I'm interviewing typically two or three people a week right now who are leading change in big systems, healthcare, uh, mental health, criminal justice. Um, you know, just kind of um, looking at them and saying, tell me how you're thinking about this and tell me how you're leading your organizations. And it's been fun. It's been fascinating. It's actually going to be the source for a book that's coming out next year. But it's been really helpful for me as I think about SNHU. I imagine. I imagine. I, I had an epiphany a few years ago where I thought I was trying to think of how to describe the funding model for higher education to people. Then I realized the best the parallel was healthcare financing. That's what yeah. I thought. Oh God, that's the, that's the worst possible one I could think of. <laughs> yeah. 
but 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 I hear you. Making these changes is uh, is very very complex, uh, very deep. Uh, just friends, if you're just joining us, um, I have a quick question I want to run by uh, by uh, President LeBlanc. But the forum is your venue. It is a place for you to ask your questions and to raise your concerns and your thoughts. So again, uh, as we proceed, uh, on the bottom of your screen, those buttons there, that raised hand button, click that if you want to be in line to join us on stage. And the Q&A box, just press that and type in your questions or your thoughts. Um, it's all about you. I, I just want to start things off and, and ask very quickly. Um, you know, where your book powerfully describes uh, a kind of decline story, uh, that higher education was a, a terrific uh, uh, upward mobility curve for so many people. And while we've increased the total number of students massively that we educate from, say, 1980 to 2012, um, there's got to be at the same time, a sense that this is broken and messed up, that the financing of higher education has been harder and harder. We know from the work of, of uh, Sarah Goldergrab that many, many people fall through the cracks because our, our financial aid system doesn't, doesn't really address realities. Um, uh, given that, uh, what are some of your main findings about how we can fix this and how we can restore the promise that higher education used to have? Yeah, so there are a number of things. Um, one is, I think we obviously have to bring down the cost. So there are policy issues clearly, and Sarah's amazing. I just interviewed her a week ago for this project I mentioned. Um, I'm reading a book she recommended to be called Administrative Burden by Herd and Morningham, which sounds terribly boring, but it's fascinating. Um, and if, you know, it's the way that we use administrative burden to actually discourage participation in voting. And you know, if you think about the FAFSA, Think about what the impact of that administrative process is on low-income students quite often. Um, so, so we have to bring costs down. To do that, we have to be much more creative about our delivery models. And the part of the problem that I hone in on in the book is that we have, with the credit hour, embedded a deeply inequitable artifact that now informs our system but creates a kind of foundation of sand. It's not a good measure of learning. And it's really does it disadvantages those who don't have the privilege of time. So if you're a low income learner, the thing you have less of than the rest of us is time and control over what time you have. So it was all I opened the book. The first chapter opens with this very pivotal encounter I had with a student in Boston who was this remarkable young woman. I call her Marion. It's not a real name in the book. Um, and, uh, and Marion had uh, gone to two of the local community colleges in Boston. She was from the poorest neighborhood of Boston, Roxbury. She was a single mom with very little sort of social capital or financial capital. And she had a seven-year-old daughter who had chronic respiratory illness. And if you looked at her school transcripts from Roxbury Community and Bunker Hill Community Colleges, they were just rife with Fs and Ws. And I asked her about this when I got to meet her. I was like, and you might look at that and say, somebody either is not ready for college or doesn't have the aptitude or whatever. And really what was happening is every time her daughter gets sick, she would miss seven to 10 days of school. She missed assignments, she fell behind on exams, et cetera, and she could never catch up. And if, she, if it was early enough in the term, she took the W. If it was too late, she took the F. And she steadily was eroding her top Pell Grant uh, amount, her cap. So when we put her in a competency-based program, which was self-paced, now when her daughter got sick, she could just hit the pause button. There is no penalty. There's no time fix, right? Um, and she said, she wonderful quote to me, she said, I'm the calendar. And when we could put her in that program, what we saw is Mary was really bright. She raced to the completion of her degree. She was gritty and persevering. So what was the problem? The problem is we built a system that works well for the system, but doesn't work well for the student in this case. And I think, um, and, I, and so the book center is on a critique of the credit hour and an argument that we need to move to competency-based measures, skills-based if you prefer. But I go on to then talk about the implications of that for financial aid, for all the creative ways we can then think about programming, for all the ways we can capture learning that doesn't happen on our campuses. I, it's an argument that higher ed no longer hold a monopoly on what counts for learning. Um, and that's painful, right? Like we have to let some of that go. And it's really an argument that says, if we are going to once again make higher education an engine of social mobility and opportunity, 
we can't continue to do what we're doing today. It worked well for an awfully long time. It isn't working well for too many people. That's a, that's a, well, first of all, thank you for that very concise summary of this involving the, car, the credit hour and pricing and the monopoly issue. Um, it, it reminds me too of that powerful phrase you used last time where you said the poverty is a tax on time. Um, that uh, it, it really just removes hours uh, and days uh, from our lives. Yeah, and, and you see it play out again and again. Um, and then you have to think about, because we use a time-based measure of learning, it contributes to things like the inefficiencies of our transfer credit system. So as Michael Horn reported in one re research study, um, the average community college student who completes an associate's degree then loses 43% of their credits when they transfer to a four-year degree program. Who goes to community colleges by and large? lower income and more students of color. So again, we're baking inequity into this. Why do they lose those credits? Well, you know the story, right, Brian? So it's because we don't actually have a good measure of learning, we're not sure that that course is suspect. Our intro to psych course has to be better than your intro to psych course. There are also institutional disincentives, our faculty disincentives. Wait a minute, if I give you if I sort of allow this transfer credit for this course, that means one more, one fewer person in the course I'm teaching, and I'm already struggling to make my enrollment numbers. So there are a whole bunch of disincentives that lead to the inequity. If we could know for certain what a student has mastered, what they can do with what they know, we remove a lot of that arbitrary um, sort of decision-making, that op opacity that goes around the transfer credit system and can build a fair and more equitable system. So assessing learning becomes a, an instrument of justice, um, which is a really, really interesting way of thinking. Of it. Yeah, and it also um, forces us to actually be clear about the claims we make for our students and to stand behind them, because we really start to shift the spotlight from inputs and content and content delivery to looking at outcomes and assessment and demonstrable skills and knowledge. And when you do that, when you shift the spotlight that way, you can get really creative about delivery models because it doesn't matter, right? You can deliver in any imaginative way that you like because we're gonna be able to know the claims you make and, if, and, and, and how you know that students can possess those skills and knowledge. This is a, a definite revolution, and we have we have questions coming in. I want to make sure people get to ask them. I did want to uh, uh, cite uh, that uh, we had uh, uh, some good comments in the chat. Jan Wild says, "You're referring to transfers." She says, "Your three credit hour course is only worth 0.67 of our courses." Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's clearly the case. Um, yeah, and a lot of times, as you know, Brian, those even the even the credits that are accepted are accepted as electives and not towards program completion. Yes. So what you often have are lower income students being required to complete more, well more than 120 credit hours to finish their degree. So we don't only require more time of them than their more privileged peers, it also costs them more. Just a win-win all around. Um, well, I, I, I I have more questions, but I want to hear from everybody else first. And uh, my good friend Phil Long has a question here. Uh, you started seeing the successes at Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, you are more worried than ever. Time is held constant and learning or purported learning varies. Did any of your peers or peer ready fix this? Yeah, so it's interesting. If you take a look at, so the, at the heart of good competency-based education is to flip that equation. I often say that the mm -hmm credit hours like the Higgs boson particle, right? It kind of, it's the dark matter that holds our higher ed universe together. Um, but if, but in that, in that particle, um, as Phil said, time is fixed, learning becomes variable. Like we're gonna measure learning at the end of 14 or 15 weeks, whatever your term length is. And at that arbitrary point, why 15 weeks? We're gonna say, this is how good you are. This is your A, B, C, D grade. And by the way, rampant grade inflation. So it's not a very, no one trusts grades any longer outside of higher ed. Um, but we're gonna do that. And we know from Bloom and others, Todd Rose talks about this in his book, The End of Average, that if you simply were to extend the term three, four, five weeks, you'd see the whole curve go to the right. A lot more, like, so you just have to give people more time. So why is time important in that? 
So competency-based education flips it. It says, let's make time the variable and let's make learning fixed, non-negotiable. And that's a very powerful piece. Now, while others doing it, I think what you've seen with CBE is kind of what you saw with the MOOCs. Like it's the Gartner curve. So we saw, you know, irrational exuberance when CBE came about. Then we saw the, well, this is disappointing, slow with despair. And now what you see are about 600 institutions who are quietly rolling out CBE programs of all kinds. So if you attend um, CBEN, for example, the, whatever their conference is, talk to Charlotte Long, who heads up CBEN. She can give you example after example, example of really compelling CBE programs that are actually fixing this, that are actually getting at it. And what's interesting in the book, we we profile some of these schools. And one of the things I wanted to do in profiling schools was include examples that I often hear from critics who say, well, look at CB is good for vocational skills. Like it's great if you're teaching IT, right? That's a demonstrable skill. You can either, your code compiles or it doesn't. But we, we profile a school of theology, right? Yeah, wow. and in, in South Dakota, and they're like, and and I often say to my colleagues in philosophy, for example, hey, you know, there's a reason why McKinsey and Accenture recruit philosophy graduates from the best schools in the country. Why? Because they have skills and competencies that those high-powered companies prize greatly: critical yeah. thinking, the ability to logic model, symbol system, language manipulation. Right? Like these are things that they prize enormously. And philosophy is a great place to find it. And yet philosophers so often don't want to make a case for themselves, <laughs> which astounds me. Uh, kind of, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the last thing I just add to that, Brian, is I think commonly people think CBE speaks to content or pedagogy, and it actually doesn't speak to either. Competency-based education is an architecture. It simply says, however you teach, whatever you teach, can you be clear about the claims you make for your students? And can you reassure us that you actually know that they, that they, that, that they perform that? So whatever, whatever your program is, are you really clear? And we don't love that. And I came out of the humanities. We don't tend to love that in the humanities. No, no, no we don't. Um, but you're showing us maybe we should think about this. Uh, maybe we should love this. We have uh, more questions piling up, and we have a question from our uh, wonderful friend, Robin DeRosa, who is also uh, New Hampshire. Uh, and she asks, some folks advocate for public health care while others support private insurance. In terms of higher ed, what role, if any, for public higher ed do you think there should be in the future? Well, you know, Adam Harris has his new book out, I'm sure many of you know it, which is an argument for, again, a kind of revival of public higher education, I had both. It was my access to affordable, high quality, but I do think there are a set of tired binaries in higher ed. Mm. And one is that public higher ed sort of does the people's work of access and private higher ed is for the privileged. And of course, there I just think that binary has fallen away. Um, so to the extent that public higher education can get back to this functional, like creating opportunity, uh, creating social mobility, supporting that in ways that are affordable, go go at it. But I think to the extent that private higher ed can do the same, um, they should do the, the you know, I, I just don't think, I think that binary falls away, Robin. I made an argument, um, I was talking, we had a meeting recently with some of the folks at the Department of Ed, and they were talking about free community college and free college models, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, hey, I think that's great, but will you extend that to privates if they meet the same tuition as the publics in the states where they reside? And they're like, whoa, like we no, should, should, but that's too hard a political sell. And I would say, look at if I can if I can match the tuition at the public institution down the street, but I can give students as good or better an experience, why wouldn't you want to make that possible? Um, it's just among the many binaries that have fallen away. That's My worry right. is that public institutions actually struggle more with the kinds of innovations I think we need for a variety of reasons. That's a huge, I'm still just reeling from the idea of thinking about private public as a, as a, as a binary we should get past. Um, but there are also more questions from, uh, from uh, more people. Uh, up at Bucknell, Leslie Harris has a specific CBE question. 
Um, if you move to a competency-based model for determining course placement and credit, what are some ways you use to measure that competency? Yeah, so I think when you, when you, as soon as you start talking about assessment in the world, and there's a whole chapter in the book on assessment, which I call the hardest work. Because by and large, higher ed doesn't do assessment very well, except where our lives matter. So we're really pretty good at assessing competencies for nurses, doctors, and pilots, right? Because I, I have a very high stake in the fact that Brian is as good at landing the airplane as he is at, on, you know, at getting us in the air. So, so we're, we, we do a good job at that. If you think about all of those fields, we don't trust courses in grades. In other words, we, it's great that you had a 4.0 at Emory-Riddle. We're still going to make you take FAA exams and time in the simulator. We're going to put you in the right-hand seat under the watchful eye of a captain in the left-hand seat before we let you captain the plane. You're going to, sometimes he's going to let you or she's going to let you take the controls and land or take off, almost with a watchful eye of someone who's better at it than you to see if you're really good at what you do. Similarly, we do this with nurses. Great that you had a 4.0 in your nursing program. You're still going to take the nursing boards. You're still going to get through the licensure process. You're going to put a lot of hours in on clinicals. And then we're going to have you under the watchful eye of our nurse supervisor for a pretty long time before we let you free. Um, last example, masters of social work. You do all of that classwork, two years typically, with internships, three years in most states before we'll let you loose, right? Three years of clinicals before we trust you because people's lives matter in those moments. But I remember when I did my sabbatical stint at the Department of Ed, we called in AIR, highly respected assessment group, right? To say, I said, you know, look at, there's so many staff members of the department who don't really understand assessment. Could you come in and do kind of a primer for them? And it was really funny. They came and they basically said, honestly, if we're gonna be really truthful, the state of higher ed, of assessment in higher ed is somewhere between bad and dismal. It's like, say more about that. I was like, well, most assessment in higher ed is sort of produced by faculty who aren't trained in assessment techniques, so wouldn't pass muster in terms of validity, reliability, general, right? All those things that the science of assessment tells us. Um, there's still so much that's just pure test taking, right? Where getting the right answer as opposed to demonstrating actual learning matters. So to go to the question, when we think about this, if you think about a competency-based model as one that says, what can you do with what you know, right? Just hold that phrase for a moment. The key there is what can you do? That immediately puts you in the realm of performative assessments, demonstrating the action. So what counts for that? Authentic assessments, project-based learning, simulations. Those are all examples of performance-based assessments, which are harder to design, typically more expensive to deliver, um, you know, it's, it's a complicated, it's easier to do a test, but it isn't actually a very good measure of learning. You know, it's interesting, Brian uh, knows that I, I think you know, Brian, I'm on the board of Chegg and Chegg has been implicated in all kinds of errors about cheating. In fact, someone on Twitter yesterday said, say more about why you're on Chegg. And it's interesting looking at some of the data, I think I can say this, I'm not sure this was internal company, but something like, you know, 40% of the exam questions that they see from, from actual exams being used in the field are just from test banks. It's faculty just generating old test bank questions that have been around for years. And those test bank questions just encourage students to cheat because getting the right answer is what gets you through yeah. as opposed to demonstrating actual learning. And the challenge of course, is if you teach engineering and you have 300 students, how do you do that? How do you do assessment? So the test becomes easy. So CBE really forces us to really rethink the delivery of learning and, and you know, it encourages the flipped classroom. So go ahead, do all your studying in like, now I'm gonna put you in a classroom where you're working on projects and I'm gonna watch. I'm just gonna walk around and see how you're doing. Um, yeah, so authentic assessment, project-based, all of those things. Which is terrific. Um, thank you and for the great- We really want assessment, Brian. That's what we do. That's what a simulator is. That's what the right-hand seat is. That's what clinical hours are. Uh, by the way, it's a, a shout out to uh, Don Shawless, who um, uh, keeps asking us to rethink higher education uh, assessment. Um, we have, this is great, we have more questions and I, I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask. Uh, we have one from uh, Betsy Kells coming to us from uh, Penn State. And Betsy's been very nice. Uh, well, I have asked her questions about her name and she has a better question here. Where do instructors fit into CPE? CBE seems like it would encourage ongoing adjunctification of higher education instructors. Yeah, so it doesn't actually, CBE makes no assumptions about how learning gets delivered. 
it, this is again, I think about those mo common, it's, I think people commonly think that CB and because it's sort of performance-based assessments necessarily dictates a role for the faculty. And if you take a look at the examples, WGU thinks about the faculty in a certain way, that the School of Theology, pretty traditional roles. Um, it's across the map. I actually think it opens up more possibilities because it invites more delivery models. And what I would say to any faculty that thinks, well, wait a minute, if this is part of the future, if this really is a better way to go, then what are the ways that I might want to develop delivery models that would be more effective in that, right? So it doesn't, that's, it's one of the frustrations I often have is that I think people think it dictates a pedagogy. It doesn't, it can actually work with any pedagogy. You could have the most traditional program. You could have, right, you could say, look at this is my psychology major. These are the courses. These are the prerequisites. These are the sequences. It looks like it always has looked before. The only thing that's different is the underlying architecture. I can say what competencies and skills people will have when they finish this program, what they can actually do with what they know. And we have been doing this now for three years at SNHU. We are mapping competencies to all of our courses just as an underlying architectural mapping. So we can say, these are the competencies. So we use what we call a 1C to 1C equivalency. So the way we've done this is to say, one comp every course has three competencies. Each one is worth one credit. Hmm. And you would say, well, wait a minute. Isn't that undercutting your argument? Like, if you say the credit hour isn't useful, why would you map your competencies to credit hours? Because the credit hour does two things. It's a time-based measurement, but it's a measurement of weight. In other words, it says that a three credit course is a certain amount of content. Is it well defined? Not at all. Can most of us recognize a three credit course when we see one? Absolutely. If I show you a syllabus, Brian, you would say, that looks a little light for a three credit course. That looks more like a one credit course, right? So we, we it's an ill-defined measure, but if we're going to adopt, if we're going to move towards competencies in the interim, we need an exchange rate. And the credit hour is an exchange rate. It says I can understand things in a certain way as a measure of weight, not time. That's a fantastic answer. Uh, and, and we have just right away, we have a, a quick uh, response to that from uh, Pete. Well, by the way, my apologies for putting Betsy in the wrong spot of Pennsylvania. She's the University of Pennsylvania, not Penn State. Uh, Pete Wallace has a, a question that follows right up on that. Uh, and Pete asks, uh, thank you for your thinking, and good to have you in Seattle, Renton. To what extent do we focus on time because we don't properly resource faculty to develop assessment? It is easier. In fact, in writing the book, Pete, it sort of led me to the second book, and it's a you're raising. I want to sort of open the aperture and then see if I can come back to this a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the question I've come to sort of wrestle with is how scaled systems like post-secondary education in America, but like healthcare, like criminal justice, like K-12, how scaled systems at some point put the needs of the system before the people the system is supposed to serve. So just think about that for a moment. In fact, I even take it a step further. I think the system, scale systems in America often come to dehumanize the people they're ostensibly made to serve. Sure. I think a lot of K-12 is dehumanizing. I think a lot of post-secondary ed is dehumanizing. Like if I were to ask this question, and this is kind of, again, not, not plugging your second book, Brian, but the, the thing I'm working on and why I'm talking to people in other systems is, if I posed it this way to you, when you look at the psychological pressure, what we do to high school kids around the admissions process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you take a look at the ways we put burdens, barriers up to low income kids like the FAFSA. If you take a look at the way we schedule time, um, you know, offices that are open from eight to four, have you ever met a 17 year old? Like what's happening at four? What about adult learners who don't get out of work till five? What happens when I need to sort of reach somebody? If you think about the exploitation of athletes, if you think about the fact that the highest paid person in America is a football coach at the University of Alabama, if you think about the exploitation of graduate students, if you think about $1.7 trillion of debt, could you sort of take that whole lineup and conclude this is a system that loves the people it serves? I don't know that I would conclude that. Wow. And, and, and I think, so then, 
but it's it's full like everyone on this call we are all complicit in a system and yet i know very few people who don't care deeply about students like there's a calling to do this work people come to higher education because we care deeply about the work we do and yet something happens in that we now become complicit in a system that does this and that's really what i'm trying to understand in that book and to go to the question that some of them, i'm going to circle back now the conclusion i have from talking to people who work and who have reformed healthcare systems or reforming substance abuse and and um and and opioid treatment who are looking at mental health systems uh criminal justice systems is that in the end there's a there's a time there's appointment systems come to serve themselves so efficiency becomes more important yeah. and and um so profits can become more important in some systems and and sort of status markers become more and a whole bunch of things that are about efficiency but they don't actually work well for the people that that we serve and i think this if i go back to marian's example our time-based system that needs people to be at a time and a place doesn't work for very well for someone who doesn't have a lot of time or control over it um, so the system is serving itself because it's efficient, right? I can schedule classes. I know where people have to be. Like everything makes sense. And it's really, I see examples of this in my own shop all the time. I had an email this morning, um, without going into the gory details that said, basically, but I said back to them, I was like, so let me be clear about this. We can't serve this group of students in question. I'm going to keep this amorphous enough because the registrar says this process is too manual. I was like, that's a system need trumping a student need straight out the damn system, <laughs> right? But we do this all the time. And what Sarah would say is that in all, most of these systems, part of what the system wants to do is push human time out of the mix. And we do underfund people. We don't, like, here's the thing that we're seeing in all of these places where that are having genuine success in reforming the system is that you can't shortcut time. So much of this work is relational and, and you have to make time. And the problem is the system will want to pull you, will pull people out. So a good example of this is our secret sauce, our, advise, our academic advisors, and they're really more like life coaches than academic advisors. Hmm. And we just did an internal study. And here's what we saw. The, as we've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, they're spending more of their time uh, inputting data. And that means less time on the phone with the students that they're working with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what those students need is more time. They just need more human time. They need to be, if we're going to be, if we're truly going to see them fully as people, which is what we need to do, particularly the students we want to serve who carry so much trauma, frankly, poverty, right, all kinds of things we need to spend more time with them. And yet our own system with all our good intention in the world is pulling our people away. Um, and in the name of efficiency, we, we don't properly staff K-12, we don't properly staff our mental health system, we don't staff it at all anymore. We, we use prisons instead, and then those prisons are understaffed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm, I'm, but, I don't... I'll tell, you, well, I'll tell you, Brian, depending on what institution you're in, if you're part of a committee that's also saying, hey, the key to promotion is more scholarship and research and other stuff that isn't about students. Yeah. You're part of the problem as well. I, I don't know any other university president on earth who talks like you, Paul. Um, <laughs> I apologize. No, <laughs> I really... <laughs> well, you're welcome. Because this is this, this isn't good. No, this is fantastic, um, and uh, and I'm I'm astonished at your vision. Uh, and, and then by the, uh, the questioner, uh, Pete Wellis, uh, thinks this is perfect. And he also reminds us of the Borges quote, maybe a librarian is just a library's way of making another library. Um, which is, which <laughs> oh, I love that quote. It is. Um, but speaking of humanists, uh, we have a great quote from the best scholarly publishing editor um, in the world. We have Greg Britton, of course. Who else could that be? Uh, and he asks a question about CBE. Uh, if the credit hour isn't serving us anymore, couldn't we also consider things like a three-year college degree? And could accreditors ever be persuaded? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting, Greg. If you're asking about the three-year college degree as like, let's find another, it's just another measure of time. It just happens to be three and not four years. 
But if you're thinking about, look at if we are decoupled from time, then we ought not to have any degrees to find by the time they take. We ought to have degrees measured by the number of competencies or 1C, 1C relations that you have. So we've had students, the first student who did our College for America CB program went from zero credits to an associate's degree in 120 days. Whoa. And it's fair to God, Brian. We, and it's, uh, you can write it, you can look it up in the um, Chronicle. There was an article about him. His name is Zach Sherman. And we were watching our first students go through the program. And we were under so much scrutiny and our Twitter and skeptics, right? They wanted to find fault with this program. And we thought, this is a friggin' disaster. If this kid graduates in 120 days with an associate's degree, we know something must be wrong. So we comb through his work, right? Because he's on the system, we could see how much time he was spending, what he was working on. We looked at his assessments. Is he cheating? Like, what's going on here? So Zach worked the midnight uh, graveyard shift at a Conagra food plant that makes Slim Jims. Three shifts a day. Who knew there was such consumption of Slim Jims? Uh, and he was somewhere in Ohio. He was like, he was, uh, he was super smart. He had always struggled with traditional classrooms. He chafed about being in classrooms. He was a voracious reader. Like we can take no credit for any of these things. Um, and he was like, we could see when he was on the platform, he would come home at the end of his shift at 8 a.m. as he'd later described to us, breakfast, shower, and then he would work for eight hours. And then he would sleep like six hours and go back to work. And he did it seven days a week because his boss had tapped him on the shoulder and said, Zach, you're really good and you're really smart and I could promote you, but you need at least an associate's degree. So now he had this incentive, a reward at the end, and he was gonna get there as fast as he could. And when we looked, he was great. Zach has gone on to a bachelor's degree. He's left ConAgra. He's working in some other white collar job now. And he had everything he needed but money and a model that would work for him. He was really poor. The other thing, by the way, I would say, Zach, he's very funny about it was, he had no living thing in his house. He didn't have a girlfriend, a spouse, kids, a pet, or even a house plant. So there were no other poles on him. You could just stay <laughs> focused, focus, focus. He's an exception. And people loved the story of speed. So to go to your question, you could have a three-year degree program. You could have a 10-year degree program if somebody needs more time to master what they need to master. You could have a one-year degree program. But it's not about the time. It's about do they actually master the learning? So when I tell the Zach Sherman story, I also like to tell the story of Lisa. So Lisa was a student in that same cohort and it took her a year and a half to pass the writing competency. She was, a, you know, honestly, she was a terrible writer. I hate to say it, I was a former writing teacher, right? And that was not her fault, by the way. If you knew Lisa's background and the impoverished schools she came out of and the lack of writing, when we asked her about this, I don't know that she had written 10 pages in all of her high school career, which had been years before anyway, wow. right? So. Lisa plugged away and plugged away and plugged away and go through the rubric and we'd work with her. And finally, after about 18 months, she got mastery on all levels. And this was just basic workplace writing. We weren't making Hemingway here. We weren't making, you know, um, Colson Whitehead. We were just trying to make Lisa a good, competent workplace writer. And she got there. And the two things she said is, um, if I had slid by with a C, which would have happened in our traditional college composition course. If she could have just got that, she never would have been a good writer. And the second part was her supervisor would never have said what he said to her after this, which is, Lisa, I didn't know you could write. And the answer was she couldn't. Um, so, so in her case, it takes longer, but the learning is genuine. And. And the pro part of the problem I think we face is that as an industry, the college degree was a signal to the labor market 30, 40 years ago that yeah. you do stuff. That was a trusted signal that you could communicate well, that you could comport yourself well, that you had quantitative skills, you had some critical thinking skills. The labor market doesn't believe that any longer. Which is putting us in a terrible spot. Um, yeah, because we're, we're passing students on the way that we long complained that K-12 passes students on. 50% of today's first year students can't do college level math or writing. Yeah. But if you know, even if you hate academically adrift, and a lot of people want to attack it, I think there's some there's some painful truths in that book, even if they're only half right. We uh, we hosted one of the authors. Um, yeah. To his current work. We, we have 
we have more questions and I, I want to get I want to get to them before I get to Opine. Um, and uh, here's one that comes from uh, Charles Finley, which is a practical strategic question, um, which is how do you balance the instructor faculty mentor fixed time against learner variable time? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard. So the way WGU would do it is that they disaggregate faculty roles. So, um, and, and we're having this conversation with our faculty now, which is how do you get to fair workload assessments? Like, what does a workload look like? It's easy when it's just, okay, it's, you know, it's three, three credit hour courses in the fall and three, three credit hours in the spring. And that's a system of convenience. It's just a box that doesn't work very well for learning or for students. So how might you think about that differently? So among the ways one could think about that would be simply how many students are you working with at any given time? It's a reasonable ratio and some will go fast some will go slow. That's not what's important. It's are they working and are they on pace and can we see how much work they're doing and are you helping them move along uh, in that work? That would be one way of doing it. Um, so I, I think, you know, there, we can we can play with the models again competency based doesn't assume a pedagogical approach so you could have them in in sort of regular courses and then it looks like something closer and the key there is that you're freeing them of time you i mean we all work so we all have time constraint our work is is time constrained but student learning should not be time constrained so our work should be but student well it has to be right if we're going to be fair like there's no way of getting around yeah. time because that's what we're buying any of us are being paid for is a certain amount of our precious commodity which is our time so that's a okay first of all charles thank you for the elegant question he always has these great great probes that just slice right through our, our discussion and thank you for that equally elegant uh, response uh, and speaking of elegance, we have more people who are just coming in with, with questions. There's one from Bill uh, Heinrich, and I want to make sure that we uh, that we didn't lose this one because it's a this is more of a strategic question. And uh, Bill asks, uh, bigger institutions are acquiring or merging with for-profit online colleges to acquire the tech and customer service tools. How will this impact access and equity? Are they gatekeepers buying more gates? Great question, Bill. Um, I don't know, Bill. It's like, a, a, I'm not sure I'm tracking the logic of the question. That's me. That's not you, by the way. So, you know, these are business model. These are underlying business model questions. And I think institutions that now know they have to be in this space, they have to be, they may decide they have to be in the space because that's what the market demands. It may be that their traditional markets are blowing up, so they need new revenue streams. There are lots of reasons why institutions move into the online space. A lot of them recognize that they can't on their own get there. So they're acquiring for profits who, you know, it's not good to be a for profit these days. It's a hard place to be. So they're bailing out. There's a lot of scrutiny of these models, as you know. Um, there are consumer protection minded folks in the Department of Ed who who are skeptical, fairly or not. But I don't know that that the business model inherently makes it more or less inequitable. In other words, I'm a little skeptical about what happens. So the question I'm wrestling with, I'd love your audience to tell me how to think about this. But as I'm working on the second book, what I keep coming back to is the question of late stage capitalism. And is it is it compatible with human serving systems? Um, because late stage capitalism, A, doesn't, doesn't put, at least in publicly traded companies, doesn't put students first, or patients first, or prisoners first. It puts shareholder value first. And for yeah. shareholder value or EBITDA to go up means you have to find efficiencies in the thing you do. And that often means pulling out expensive human resources wherever you can. Um, so I don't know, I'm really wrestling with this question. Um, and, and the reality is that not-for-profits have their own version of profit that they pursue called surplus. Um, but no one gets rich, right? Like no one gets to walk away with an equity check. No. Um, no shareholders have to be satisfied every three months. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting question I wrestle with. But I don't think the the acquisition of for profits in order to get capacity is inherently and uh, doesn't inherently feed inequity. But I think it's suspicious. I think we need to look at it. Well, Bill, great question. 
great question. And, and Paul, thank you for the very rich answer. Uh, friends, people are, are showing us lots of uh, uh, text questions, but I want to make sure that people have a chance to uh, ask us a video question. So if you'd like to join us on stage, simply press that teal colored button and you will be beamed right on stage. So um, please join us uh, if you can. And while people are turning their cameras on and stretching and combing their hair, uh, let me get another one of these great questions uh, up here. This is from uh, Danette Long at uh, Northern State University where she's an instructional designer. Uh, and she asks more of a connection or a statement, but this line of thinking makes me consider the systematic rule that says students have to graduate in four years in order to count on university metrics of success. Uh, yeah, Danette, that's, I'm glad that seems to be a theme here that we are questioning that. Um, but the, the yeah. So that's all of our financial aid system is built on time-based rules and it's one of the impediments to CBE. So when the, when the language of direct assessment was created in the last Title IV Act, the one we still live with years and years later, um, it said that in lieu of the credit hour, financial aid could be dispersed on the basis of direct student learning. Imagine that, in lieu of the credit hour, you can actually get financial aid based on actual learning. So there was even the kind of an admission in the act that the credit hour doesn't do that. But what happened, of course, is nothing changed with federal financial aid rules. So again, in this book that I've mentioned earlier, Administrative Burden, you sort of see all of these rules that are time-based that make it so hard to do CB. So in the fifth chapter of this book, this new book, I make an argument for an alternative financial aid model, not based on time, so measurement of success would not be how many people graduate in four years. The actual measurement is six years, as you probably know, three years for associates. But actually, it would be financial aid paid out for performance. So as students complete competencies, they would get access to more and more financial aid. Because in the right now, what we do is we front load financial aid. We pay all of the money up front. And then students either succeed or they don't succeed. And we have something called return to Title IV. So we have to do this money back to the feds after a certain point. And then students have to pay back. And they're like, what's going on? I don't get this. And what we end up doing is paying massive amounts of public dollars for failure. And what I'm trying to argue is that there is a different model. Now, look, at we're not going to change the federal financial aid system overnight. I'm not naive about this. So what I argue for is a demonstration project, hmm. right? Congress can do demonstration projects which say, we're gonna create a sandbox and we're gonna try this stuff. We're gonna invite a set of schools to do this and then we'll see what the results are and see if it can change things. And the most successful version everyone here knows was the demonstration project that lifted the 50% rule. So in the past, as you know, 50% of your degree experience had to be on the ground. No more than 50% could be online. And then a demonstration project was created that said, no, we're going to let a set of schools apply and see they can go beyond 50%. They can lift the cap. And what happened is that a number of schools said, okay, we're going to do 100% online. We're going to see how that works. And that's what really spurred the creation of online learning as we know it today, this kind of you know, um, behemoth that online learning has become. And the reality is in the early years, the not-for-profits looked down their nose at it and they seeded the market to the, for the for-profits. And they rushed in and nature abhors a vacuum. There was a real demand and adults voted with their feet. And uh, at their height, the for-profits accounted for 12% of all American college students. Yeah. And now, of course, what we have seen is that the for-profits have gone in steep decline and the non-for-profits have taken back that market. But it took a long time. And a lot of bad things happened in the meantime. Uh, you say that, and in one hour, I have to teach a class with this fantastic book, by Tracy Cotton, uh, Lower Ed. So if, friends, if you don't know this book, you absolutely have to read it if, if, you're, if you're interested in this. Paul, we're, we're almost out of time and we had a, a technical question from uh, Mathieu from Quebec. And I wanna make sure he got this question in as well. If it takes 10, year, 10 years to complete the requirements, should the early competencies be rechecked before graduating? Yeah, I wrestle with that, you know, so we, we just had this, we had the opposite version, right? Which we had a student in this, again, this is the system not being thoughtful about student need. We had a student who wrote to me, basically saying she was about to withdraw because out of her frustration that we wouldn't accept a math course that she had taken beyond our limit. I think it was 10 years of when we would accept transfer credits. And I, I called up the course like, 
this math hasn't changed. Like, why would we not accept those transfer credits? Um, she was a very good student in every other respect. Uh, we have to think about that question because one of the arguments for competency-based education uh, within competency-based education is your competencies time out. In other words, not only yeah. should we recheck them to know that you still have them, and by the way, a lot of us wouldn't withstand that scrutiny if we were asked to do a lot of the things we learned as undergraduates today. Like I shudder to think about what my trig would look like or my knowledge of chemistry. Um, but. But the other thing is we know that a lot of competencies and skills now are timing out, but enduring skills tend not to. We might want to make that distinction. Um, so enduring skills, what some people call soft skills, would be skills of communication and writing and critical thinking, which tend to get better with accretion, while hard skills, so-called hard skills like engineering skills, actually degrade faster and faster and faster. I was talking to one of my peers, I won't name the school, but she heads up really preeminent engineering program. And she was saying that her struggle is to get her faculty to understand that they really have to now shift to thinking about frameworks for learning because the actual engineering skills and technologies they're teaching are going out of date faster than ever. So they need to, they need to get engineers with the skills to land them a job, but more importantly, they need engineers who are gonna retool every three years because that's about the pace of change right now. I saw a, uh project, if I told you this, it was at a Connecticut school where they had, uh, they brought in speakers to update faculty and staff on the cutting edge fields that were changing that quickly. And they decided to publish these results as DVDs. So why? That sounds kind of retro. And they said the idea was that it would, it would pin that finding in time. So, you know, it was printed in 2011 or so, you would know that automatically. Um, and it would have that, and it would recede into the past like a book would. Uh, but you know, the, yep. if, you, if you wanted to get updated, you'd have to get you have to get something more. Speaking of time, uh, we've run out again. Time is fixed. Here an hour. Uh, time is fixed, and also fixed is the ability of the future transform community to ask fantastic questions, and for you, Paul, to have fantastic answers. Thank you so much for for sharing so much of your thought. Um, are are you still blogging or sorry, tweeting at uh, SHNU Prez? I am. I am, I, and there's a connection to the blog post and there's a website for the book. So yeah, okay. yeah, happy to continue the conversation with anybody. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. It's just a pleasure to be with you as always and with this group. It's a terrific, terrific group you've assembled. Oh, it's, it's, it's my, absolutely my pleasure on, on both sides. Um, and everyone grab this book while you still can. And, uh, and Paul, enjoy the rest of your day. I hope the sun stays out in Seattle. It is out for now. So thank you very much. Take care everyone. Thank you again, Brian, be well. But don't go, everybody. Uh, I need to show you what's happening next, and uh, I meant it. Uh, you all are fantastic at asking questions. Looking ahead, we have for Future Transform sessions on rethinking and learning, the iron triangle of quality, access, and affordability, and what eco-media literacy might be. If you'd like to keep talking about these questions, about the fixed and variable time, and you'd like to think about CBE and all these issues, just keep tweeting at us. Use the hashtag FTTE. You can tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events, or hit my blog up, brianalexander.org. If you'd like to look into the past, like if you'd like to look into our sessions on CBE or uh, Paul's first appearance on this program, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And of course, remember to subscribe. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, we're in autumn right here in the Northern Hemisphere. Things are getting a little cooler and also a little crazier. I hope all of you take care that your teaching and learning is at the highest possible efficacy and that your lives are as balanced as can be. And above all, I hope all of you take care and are safe and sound. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>